Thank you, thank you. A round of applause. Let's bring the energy up. It's the last session of the day. It's almost over, gents and ladies. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all for being here, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> um, today, there's a war taking place on Gaza, a war of horrific human costs and implications. It is rightfully grabbing the world's attention at the moment, although arguably not enough for the world to act effectively as it should and put an immediate end to it, regrettably. But in parallel, there's another war being fought in the region, one that has been taking place for the last few years. It's true that the war in Gaza is louder and definitely deadlier, but that other war is no less serious in its consequences, be it constructive and not destructive. I'm referring, of course, to the war that the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman declared from this very stage almost five years ago to the day. His personal war of making the Middle East the new Europe. This new Middle East is not going to materialize over a fortnight, of course. There are many challenges and obstacles abound in the region. But Rome was not built in a day. And the sheer strength of will and the scale of determination are so monumental, it demands that everyone buys into that hope. For this dream to become a reality, a new economic path is being forged, diversifying beyond hydrocarbons, driven by a number of strategic sectors of the future, turning on the region's engine of growth, that is Saudi Arabia. The successes achieved here will undoubtedly have a positive spillover effect on the wider region, pulling it all ahead as a rising tide lifts all boats. This vision ushers in a new era of investments, one with strategic purpose and impact. So how are global investors aligning themselves with these pivotal trends, and how are they navigating the flourishing regional investment landscape? That is what we're going to try to touch upon in this session, along with my panelists. Gentlemen, good evening. I'm happy to uh, introduce them very quickly. Abdel Majid Al Hagbani, starting here to my near left, is the head of the MENA Securities at the PIF. Uh, Omar Al Maidani, the CEO of Vision Invest. Bruce Flatt, the CEO of Brookfield. Daniel Loeb, CEO of Third Point. And last but not least, Ron O'Hanley, Chairman and CEO of State Street. Abdel Majid, let me start off with you. Give us an insight on how PIF views the investment imperatives of this new economic era that the Saudi Arabia is embarking on. How is PIF creating value through its strategic investments for Saudi and for the wider region as well? Firstly, thank you uh, for having me here. And uh, I thank all, all the panelists here with their great minds uh, to, to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, coming back to the, to the question, I think this is an extreme pivotal time when it comes to how, how PIF is seeing its investment specifically uh, in the region. Um, within the domicile, let's say, of MENA, as you described it, that this is the new Europe based on uh, uh, the Crown Prince uh, statement. And this is our ambitious, just to make sure that we are tapping into the right markets, and we believe that the MENA market is attractive, and we believe that the MENA market is having a lot of accreditation that can take place going forward, uh, from, from our uh, actually side as, as PIF, uh, we believe we have a successful story that, that we are telling now and to be told even uh, in, in the future. Based on that, in a snap, we had created uh, six new companies, vehicles, which is only investing in MENA region, uh, and mainly in six countries, which was announced previously, which is uh, Egypt, Sudan, Iraq, Bahrain, and, and, uh, and Oman, uh, uh, and Jordan. 
so all these six countries is becoming uh, our focus in all our investments. And I, I think, think a pipeline of $24 billion was earmarked e for e these, Exactly, uh, exactly, so which is equivalent to 90 billion real. Mm. Uh, we are sector ag uh, agnostic across all the, the sectors, and I think we will add a huge value. Just to give you an example, we just uh, announced the, the, the healthcare city in, in, in Jordan, uh, which is a $350 million uh, dollar, uh, investment that has 600 seats in its university, along with UCLA and King's uh, College. Uh, and we are having around 330 beds uh, in the hospital, 72 outpatient clinics. So all these, let's say, details, which is, this is just a small glimpse mm. about our ambitious of upscaling all the infrastructure from purely investment basis that, that has a good, let's say, mirroring when it comes to the economics. Uh, I mean, healthcare tourism in Jordan specifically is very big in the region. Um, uh, Omar, economic diversification away from the seemingly total dependence on hydrocarbon revenues, this has been a stated goal here in the GCC for many decades. Like growing up, we're always here about diversification away from hydrocarbon. So what makes it different this time? And are there any risks on slipping back on, 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 on this commitment? Uh, thank you, Nasser. Good evening, everyone. And uh, first, uh, for those of you here uh, to hear Mr. Abunayan, I would like to express his sincere apologies for not being with us tonight. He has come down with a cold and he has lost his voice. While I'm taller, I'm nowhere as experienced <laughs> uh, or as smart as Mr. Abunayan, so I hope I can add a bit of value. There's a cult to following this, uh, here great panel. for Mr. Abunayan. Uh, I think we've lost that crowd here now. And to be honest with you, it's a great panel as well, so I hope I can give a bit of color. Um, definitely, we're in the right direction. And that right direction is stemming from a clarity in vision. Uh, and that vision, not only is it clear, but it is coming with clarity in terms of the execution plan and the role of both the public sector and the private sector. So I don't see, uh, as at least speaking from a Saudi perspective, I don't see going back. I really see it moving forwards. If I give you an example today of uh, a partner that we have the pleasure of working with, which is Air Products and Chemicals, a publicly listed company in the United States, today invested in more than 47 countries. Uh, they have now invested about $12.5 billion in Saudi Arabia in the past five years in three different projects, in three, if I may say, parallel sectors, but different sectors. One is green hydrogen, the other is generating uh, power from air separation unit, and the, the third is producing hydrogen. Now, that to me is the proof of the pie, if I may say, in terms of economic diversity, in terms of having the regulatory enablement that allows that foreign direct investment uh, to come in, and to also show the consistency for this equity and this capital to repeat itself. Uh, if you want to look at the diversification of what we are seeing today in Nasser in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I'm sure the PIF is in much better position to speak about the giga projects and the enablement, and maybe my colleagues Bruce and others on the real estate sector. But if you look at the infrastructure sector, and you just take the National Center for Privatization in Saudi Arabia, and you look at what is currently being tendered in the market, from schools to hospitals to custom zones to water pipelines to water reservoirs, I think this is diversification. Mm. We're not speaking it, we're living it. Um, Ron, as the GCC transitions beyond hydrocarbons, what emerging sectors demonstrate the most strategic potential for investors, global investors, seeking diversification opportunities into this region? Well, again, thanks, uh, thanks for being here. I think this is an important topic. And um, I think the world's investors are very focused on the region, but particularly uh, Saudi because not just of its stated goals, but of all of the, pro of, of the progress it's made in a very short period of time uh, in that diversification. You asked what's different about it this time. I think the diversification that's gone on for many, many years throughout the region has really been about, let's set aside some money and grow that money. We'll invest it all over the world 
get some returns from financial markets so that future generations can benefit from the wealth that may not be there from hydrocarbons. This is much more deliberate what we're seeing now, which is what are the industries and sectors that we can invest in either that Saudi might have competitive advantage in or that are very important for the population to grow for jobs and things like that. So in terms of the world's investors, what they're looking at is uh, they're seeking return. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and, and the question will be, how can they seek return? Because for now, at, at this point, much of these investments are actually private. Um, PIF is actually one, one, is one of the major investors. But what the world will be seeking is, how do capital markets grow to actually support that? You've got a, and we talked about this in the green room, right? You've got an economy that's growing very, very rapidly. Uh, it'll be you know, tripled in uh, less than 10 years in terms of GDP. Um, the financial economy needs to grow at the same pace, the investment economy and markets to be able to support that and also to create a sort of flywheel effect to that. So in terms of sectors, I think it's about what can Saudi do that's competitive? And there's lots of things that they are doing. All you have to do is just take a drive around Riyadh and, and, and see what those are. Bruce, what potential risks can global investors mitigate when investing in the GCC markets versus other markets around the world. And as such, how has your portfolio allocation into the region evolved over the last few years? And what are your future AOM targets for the region? So uh, look, our business uh, is about investing in the backbone of the global economy. So firstly, uh, this region and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, needs a massive amount of the backbone of the global economy. It needs to transition the business, it needs to build infrastructure, it needs to replace infrastructure, it needs to grow people, it uh, needs residential housing. There's enormous amounts of um, things that it needs here. Um, I, I just, so our, our business is about uh, building infrastructure, uh, building renewables, building real estate, and running industrial businesses. And um, those things are all we do them around the world. We have $850 billion of businesses. We have uh, just under $10 billion in this region. We're building out every one of those businesses in Saudi Arabia. And um, I, we, we will be much, much bigger in the future. And I, I, look, it's, compared to the United States, this is not as big of an economy, so it's never going to be the scale of that. But uh, we will be putting large, large sums of money to work uh, in the country. Um, and uh, it, there are some very attractive uh, things to do. So we're, we're really excited about it. Dan, we've touched upon the, um, uh, the part of the diversification efforts in the region uh, with this renewed vigor in privatization where the state is spinning out or offloading these state-owned companies and going public with them on local exchanges. Um, there has been so many of these in the region in the past two years that I've even lost track of the number of companies that are coming on. Uh, so what are the important ingredients for a success uh, or a successful privatization process do you think that would you know, present a win-win uh, situation to all stakeholders? Well, f first of all, thank you for having me here. And this conference has really been terrific. I mean, sometimes these things tend to be sort of networking events, but I have to say it was in the room most of the day, and the content has been incredible. So I just want to thank the people who organized this. And uh, you left out one thing on my bio. You said CEO and founder of Third Point. I'm also a brand ambassador for Alula, and uh, anyone who hasn't visited Alula yet should go there. Not only is it a lovely place to visit, but it really puts... Saudi ingenuity and focus, and what you talked about, the single-minded focus to transform the region, but to do it um, with alacrity, but with taste, and you know, every aspect of it has been, and it's just a work in progress. It's a really interesting thing to see. Um, so I just want to mention that before I dig into this. So look, on the surface, what is a successful privatization from an investor's standpoint? Uh, you buy it when it goes public, and then you make money on it. But um, that's not enough. There are some preconditions that need to go into that, and there's a reason why the financial markets here are thriving. Number one, the, the corporate governance is, is improving. I think you know, most of these are controlled companies, so one thing I caution is just making sure that you continue to have uh, 
a voice for shareholders and accountability for boards and management teams such that there's uh, a mechanism through uh, proxy representation and communication and transparency, and I see that improving. Number two, it's the investment environment in the region. And, and it, it's wonderful to see a country where the, the government is singularly focused on reaching definitive goals and looks at business as a partner, not as an adversary. Now, unfortunately, the United States is very different now. You have leaders that are, you know, that have mired business with red tape and regulation that are, you know, supporting unions and doing things that, you know, are not pro-business. So here I think it's viewed as a win-win. So I really think, you know, you've got the key ingredients here. Uh, it's just continue to unleash that ecosystem of capital markets, uh, good governance, and a government that really understands and appreciates rule of law and partnership with business. Abdel Majid, despite the drop in Saudi GDP this year, in 2023, relative to last year, um, this drop is due to the oil production cuts, part of the OPEC Plus agreements. But non-oil GDP continues to expand at a solid clip, and that's partly due to the investments that the PIF has been driving forward and developing uh, in a particular number of strategic sectors. Maybe you can elaborate and shed some light onto the, these investments and the relative sectors that you're looking at. Perfect. So diversification is the name of the game. I think this thing has been adopted back then that we should not be fully uh, oil dependent uh, on our economy. And this transformation, I think, has, has took place uh, in a swift mode, which is great. And, and we are actually racing with time to make sure that uh, we are not dependent on one source of, uh, of energy. Just maybe to give you some examples about how, maybe from my context as, as, as PIF, uh, maybe a beloved example that I always uh, discuss, maybe in, even in the small circles, uh, which is uh, ADAS. I think it was one of, of the successful uh, companies that we, we targeted in London Exchange, delist this company, relocate the company to, uh, to Riyadh, uh, and relist it in, in, lately in the IPO. It is the largest IPO, I think, in Saudi uh, for, for, for this year. So this kind of diversification, and we are trying even to focus on, on the regional part as well. So as, uh, as you know that we have, just to give you an example, uh, the Saudi Egyptian, let's say, uh, investment company, uh, this company is a form of diversification in the area. I think we have added or invested around $1.3 billion up to now uh, in Egypt in, in around six uh, sectors. Uh, and it is becoming a brilliant, with, with all the fluctuation in the currencies, I think we are gaining uh, or harvesting uh, a great return uh, from, from these kind of investments. Um, Oman is, is another panel that we are looking at. It has a great outlook uh, going forward. They have a huge belief that they need to structure, uh, let's say, the ecosystem there to, to get more FDIs uh, and to simplify the investment process there. We have debated our uh, first investment uh, in, in, in Abraj, uh, which was the, uh, in the IPO. So this is the form and the version of diversification that we are looking mm -hmm. for uh, in terms of within Saudi Arabia, uh, bringing companies and having this centralization uh, and value chain uh, to localize it here in Saudi and having even uh, the, the, the Saudiization level in, in these companies uh, is becoming available. So it's, it's a long run, yes. uh, but we are uh, trying to, to, to keep up this, the pace. Um, Omar, you have great experience when it comes to infrastructure projects, particularly uh, power and desalination. That's your bread and butter, basically. Um, how have the terms offered to private sector investors in Saudi infrastructure projects, how have they evolved in the last few years? What are really the enablers in place now to move such infrastructure projects forward? Thanks, uh, Nasser. We don't have great experience. We have a little bit of experience in 
Aquapower is now a PIF company and a publicly listed company. Well, you're on the board of Aquapower. I am on the board. It's an honor yeah. to be there as well. Mm. Uh, I think, first of all, let's look at the privatization scheme and IPP and IWPP is not new to the kingdom. Uh, for those that recall, Shoeba started in 2004. So if I may say, uh, as, a, uh, as a business line, uh, this is not new to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think what has changed is a number of things. Uh, one is um, the formation of the National Center for Privatization, which is acting as a regulator for the privatization initiatives. Um, the implementation of the PPP law in the kingdom, which is now giving clarity in terms of the regulatory framework that is covering this sector. And then third, I think we have seen really a great maturity, Nasser, with the mindset of the procurers, the stakeholders whether they are the ministries, or even if you look at some of the crown corporations, in terms of recognizing that there is a value proposition for the private sector to come in and provide that infrastructure on an outsourced basis. And a better understanding of how to look at that value proposition and how to contract it. I think today the framework that we have in the kingdom, I have to say, in terms of maturity, is on par with developed PPP markets, such as the UK and elsewhere. This is on the one hand. Second is because this program is not nascent, and this is, I think, what is I'm, the point that I'm trying to make is this is not new. We've been doing this since 2004. The amount of foreign direct investment that has been channeled through this has demonstrated not only to the local market but to the international market that this is a market in which you can invest and you can invest in long term. As you will know, infrastructure projects you are investing, you are constructing for five years, and you are in it for almost 20 or 25 years. So you really have to have that long-term outlook. Third is, I think, with the clarity of the vision and the demand on infrastructure going forwards, for a lot of the foreign direct investors coming into the kingdom, they understand that they're not coming into a one-off story. Mm. This is a demand that is going to continue to grow. As the giga projects that are being launched by the PIF grow, so will the demand for infrastructure. This is the enabler, and then the infrastructure will have to cope with it, be it on the utility side or other. Uh, Bruce, how would you assess the yields offered by infrastructure and real estate sectors here in the GCC, given the inherent risk level compared to other markets? And what specific themes in those sectors are you pursuing? Look, the, uh, there's no doubt for the equivalent risk across any infrastructure, renewables, um, or real estate sector, you're getting a, a, a premium here versus uh, called the United States. Um, so that's a, an attractive reason to do it. And, and, and you're not taking, in many emerging uh, developing or other countries outside of uh, investors that invest in U.S. dollars, you're taking U.S. dollar risk. And the great thing investing here is that we're investing into a peg currency with a strong economic um, backing behind it. And that's um, extremely uh, valuable in the thing. So the returns here can um, be better. And I think what's going to happen over time uh, as we further bring FDI into the country, as PF continues to support uh, businesses and funds in the country, uh, as more money comes here, it's just going to bring the yields down. And uh, all of this is a circular process because um, what's happening is that there, uh, Saudi Arabia is regularizing its capital markets, its institutional markets, its investment markets, and in the fullness of time, it's, it's highly possible that the returns will be less. And therefore, the... Um, the, uh, the cost of capital in this country will be very, very low. And, uh, and that is uh, inures to the benefit of all the people of the country. So that, that's, I guess, the biggest thing that's going on in my mind. And um, I, there is an enormous culture of respect of capital in this country and a support for business. Not only support for business for us to do it, but PIF uh, supports its friends and partners outside of the country, and it supports us in the country. And uh, I can't say that for that many countries in the world. There are some others, but uh, it gives an enormous benefit 
to um, sponsors that are willing to be here, have people here, and build out their business. Mm. Uh, Dan, has Third Point placed any investments in the region so far? Are you considering dipping a toe in our part of the pond? Um, we, indirectly, we've been investors in U.S. companies, not Air Products, but other companies that had, have significant stakes here. And one of the interesting things we've observed, well, actually the first time I came here was on a trip to visit uh, the Sadara chemical plant, which Dow Chemical owned with Khaled Al-Fara, Al Khaled Al Al-Fara, Al 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 sorry, I know his name. I was <laughs> got stage fright there when I tried to pronounce it. So yeah, with Khaled and, um, and um, you know, it was such a different country then. It was 2017. We had, had the honor of meeting with the then deputy uh, crown prince who told us his vision. And it sounded, frankly, I won't say fanciful. It sounded ambitious. But it's amazing to see how much of that has been realized. Um, since then, some of the other country, companies that we've invested in, uh, the, the portion of their, of their revenues that are in Saudi are their fa is the fastest growing part of their business. So Jacobs Engineering is one company that we invest in. It has sort of a mid-single-digit uh, growth rate. But the portion, which is not insignificant, about 10% of the business is growing low double digits that's here in Saudi. But I'm, I'm definitely uh, excited at looking at other opportunities where there's enough liquidity and scale. And also on the private side of our business, looking at uh, you know, one of the things that this conversation uh, uh, hasn't touched on, but the, you know, the need for, for local capital, for credit here. I mean, obviously, the, the, it's rich with, cap, with capital, but the banking system is going to need more capital. And it'll be interesting to see how the private lending business uh, mm. evolves here as well. Ron, do, I mean, we've touched upon capital markets and the need to further develop it here in Saudi Arabia. Do the current investment vehicles or structures allow for an effective uh, foreign investors' participation into the Saudi capital markets? And what are the channels that can give you access to some, uh, some of the uh, prized assets, giga projects, whether directly or indirectly, like NEOM or the, the, the Red Sea, do you think? Well, <clears throat> I, I, certainly there's vehicles that are in place that do enable investment, but I think what you're seeing is a, an economy where the capital markets and the financial economy need to catch up with the real economy. So what needs to be done, Ron? So f first of all, the capital markets, you don't have a debt market um, the, way, the way you'd like to be. Dan just mentioned that in terms of, we really do need a public debt market to help support all this. Uh, in terms of the actual equity markets and the public equity markets, for, I mean, it's no fault of the Saudis. A lot of this investment necessarily needed to be private. But as you think about recycling that capital, monetizing, those investments, what you want to do is put it into the private markets. To do that, you need a few things. One, the kind of uh, 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 principles that Dan was talking about for the investor. I'd also say you need a lot more liquidity than you've got now. Um, so you need to think about vehicles that will help foster liquidity. I mean, the ETF, market, the, uh, ETF vehicle is actually one that can do that uh, in terms of uh, providing that liquidity but also enabling investors outside the region to invest. I mean, you could envision a, line, <coughs> a, a range of ETFs launched here, but also in Hong Kong, also in Luxembourg, to attract other investors. Um, and, and then finally, what, what you, you need to be thinking about is, how do you think about the retirement system in the country, and how can that be the enabler of capital markets? If you think about some of the great success stories around the world, and think about Australia back now 40 years ago. Um, I mean, the country was nearly flat on its back with a broken retirement system. And the combination of using the retirement system to encourage and incent investments in the public markets, but also to enable people to actually have a safe retirement. Uh, the U.S., a different kind of example in the 70s and 80s with the development of the defined contribution system. And given just the age demographics of the, of, of the working people here in uh, Saudi Arabia. You've got an ideal opportunity to, uh, to blend retirement markets and retirement vehicles with capital markets vehicles to develop capital markets and yes. enable the kind of flywheel effect that you want to put in place. Abdel Majid, on, on the point of, and probably this is the last round of questions, we've got four or five minutes. 
um, what, what's PIF doing to, you know, uh, deepen the markets uh, uh, regionally, and we've got some of the big asset managers here. What are you guys doing for the small boutique asset manager, local asset manager? So we, we, we all agree that the capital market is, is, is the, the real mirror of the economy. And fueling this economy through the, the capital market is extremely important and should be enormous in order to, to have the same, sp the same space. Um, just moving on how PIF is, is being actually rolled when it comes to, to its investments. So we have our direct uh, way and indirect way. So starting with the indirect, just going back in the 70s when, when PIF has created some of the companies and we are seeing these companies now is, is, is the blue chips of, of, uh, of the market. And even from, from the direct basis, so all the selling uh, uh, that took place lately in terms of Aqua, the, the share, the Dowell, uh, um, Addis, which I just came... Mm. So just so to give you a small information here, um, the, uh, the number or, or the value of, of the new IPOs that took place mm. in the last two years, I think it is 113 billion in terms of market cap, additional market cap to and the market. And today, how, how much is that? Today, it's 300-something billion, which is around 170%. This is NPI portfolio, mm. Mm. the IPO portfolio, which shows that investors is actually not seeing these companies as only an investment opportunity. Yes, it's a long-term view mm. on this company and how can PIF contribute. Just going back to the question, what we are doing. But let's, uh, let's, uh, what about the boutique uh, asset manager? Yes, so, so boutique is an important component in, into this league. We believe that you know, the, the boutique asset managers, they usually uh, have great experience. Uh, they are uh, engaged when it comes or, or aligning the interest with the investors themselves. Yes. And we want to invest on them uh, in general in the long term. And we have seen, uh, and we have actually accompanied with, uh, with, with some of the investors and it's, it's, a, it's a great actually story. Bruce, how do you assess the ESG factors in your investment decisions within this region? Uh, Globally, and this region, no different. Mm -hmm. um, we're the largest, or uh, I think, the largest transition investor in the world. And what that means is that we, every asset we have, um, we think about the terminal value. And when you look at the terminal value, uh, we, all often, we always have, but increasingly now do, look at where will the terminal value be in the future. And one of those things is What's the carbon footprint in the future? And uh, our, our view isn't that things are black or white or green or black or good or bad. It's that we just have to, we're funding companies in our transition business to have less carbon. And uh, so the carbon footprint is going down. That's what our goal is. So our, we raised a very large fund two and a half years ago for transition investing. It was 15 billion. We're out raising a second fund. Uh, we'll be deploying uh, and are deploying some of that money here and across the region. And uh, it's, this is a business that is going to be going and trillions of dollars will be invested into it over the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years to really just um, help companies get less carbon. Hmm. Um, Omar, I'm going to end with you. We only have half a minute left. But, uh, you know, the, tr the energy transition in Saudi... 50% of power by 2030 is going to come from renewables. Uh, how, what the, the, the magnitude of the investment opportunity within the whole value chain of renewable energy, how do you look at that? I, I think it's uh, massive and uh, the Ministry of Energy has been quite clear in terms of the energy mix, as you said, both in terms of renewable and gas. But if I may just give you an example, I think there is also the hydrogen story, uh, which is now being charted in the kingdom. And I think today, if I give you an example of just one project, um, which is under construction today in Saudi Arabia, the world's first and largest green ammonia plant to produce almost 1.25 million tons. Just to give you uh, a parameter here, this is 4,000 megawatt equivalent at a time when the largest facility in existence today is somewhere between 50 to 100 megawatt equivalent. Uh, and this is an eight and a half billion dollar project under execution in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in Neom, between three partners, Air Products, Aquapower and Neom. So this is one project. So if you just think of the 
green hydrogen story, add to that the renewable energy story, add to that the gas story, and the blue hydrogen story, I think you will be looking at numbers that are uh, far beyond the calculator that I have in my pocket. <laughs> Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we've got. I want to uh, thank you all, Ron, Dan, Bruce, Omar, Abdel Majid, and uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gents, for supporting us the last session of the day, and hope to see you all uh, tomorrow on the last day of the FII this year. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.